You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Thank you for joining me here today on this Training Thursday show, where we're going to be answering the question of how often you should be exercising. We all know that we should be moving, right? We should be moving our bodies. We should be exercising. How often should we do that? How often should we do cardio? How often should we lift weights? And I really want to answer that. I want to do it a little bit through body types, which we've been getting into. Hopefully, you've been tuning in this past Tuesday, episode 907. We went into the first time of what the body types are, what is your unique body type, and we'll be going over that the next couple of weeks as well. So stay tuned, but today I will absolutely be sharing for your body type how often you should be exercising, what exactly you should be doing, and I want to go through some research as well. So that research will basically set the stage saying, hey, you know, this is what it looks like in the real world. Now it's also backed up by science. That's the best, really. If you can have the anecdotal evidence, which means like you see this work in the real world, that's what I care about the most. But then I also want science to be able to qualify that as to why it works in the real world. I think it's fantastic to have both. I'm an advocate of both. And I also am an advocate of listening to the top people out there so that we don't have to wait for the textbooks or studies to come out saying, oh yeah, this works, this works, and this works. Because I always remember that was kind of funny when I was coming up in the industry in the early 2000s, we'll put it, and kind of looking and learning from everyone out there. And people would ask them like, oh, you know, what studies is that? And they're like, yeah, it isn't in a study yet. And they're like, okay, well, how do you know that it works? They'll say, well, I've worked with thousands of people and and that's why I can tell you it works. And some people would agree with that and some people wouldn't. It was always funny to me to look at it. I was always one of the people that agreed with it because I'm like, yeah, I mean, it, it works, right? You're doing it and it works. But then you also want to know why it works and for how long it works. So for example, a really good one with this, and I like to pick on keto, so I'm going to do it again today anyway. Like keto works but it doesn't work forever. Like That's the whole thing about it. So it's like, okay, how long you should be doing it? Well, it seems to matter age-wise. seems to matter if you're male or female as well. Some are between three and six weeks, maybe up to 10 to 12 weeks. For females, typically less. Starts to lower thyroid. Again, you can test all these things as well. I mean, if you've been doing keto and you've kind of not lost as much of the weight, you can run a thyroid adrenal hormone test. You can look at your cortisol levels. You can look at your thyroid levels. And we see it all the time. And right now, studies are starting to come out. Somewhere between maybe 45 and 60% of women don't do well on a keto-based diet. And it's because of this, this, and this reason. Now, if we look at genetics as well, we can say, okay, well, this specific APOE genotype, they shouldn't get more than about 10%, maybe 20% max of their macros from fat. After that, causes too much inflammation, can lead to cardiovascular-based disease. And then the people say, well, oh, fat has nothing to do with cardiovascular-based disease because of this, this, and this study. And you can say, well, that's absolutely true, but here's the thing. This APOE genotype that we're talking about, that we know that uh, specific types of fat, namely saturated fat, increases inflammation in their body and increases their cardiovascular risk. Well, we can look at it. They only make up about 26% of the population. So of course, they're not going to show up in the studies as the major mover. They're not. And that's because about 50 to 65% of the population is that APOE 3.3. And when you look at that, well, those are the ones who can do well with a decent amount of fat. The APOE2 actually does really well with a higher amount of fat. So again, that's a much rarer body type though. And when you look at that, you can kind of get to understand that different things are going to work for different people. And so when people are preaching, you know, it's keto or nothing, I'm just saying like, I don't think that's such a great idea. And not only that, it's probably pretty harmful for a lot of people. So same thing with exercise is like, we're looking at exercise as, is it a one size fits all? Should everybody be doing that level of exercise? Or are there different variations? And of course, there are different variations. We're going to give you those today. But you have to understand, there's a reason why a lower carb or keto-based diet works well, at least in the beginning for a lot of people. And that's because if you're looking to lose weight, we know that the body holds more water too, even if you just eat carbohydrates. But the other thing is this, is that carbohydrates for people that are desensitized to essentially insulin, well, they're not going to absorb and utilize carbohydrates as well. 
But that doesn't mean that for a lot of the ectomorph body types or vata body types, they're not going to thrive off carbohydrates, right? There's a huge difference. And it doesn't mean that those people, it's going to cause diabetes or cancer because we know that they utilize sugar really well, where some people do not. So again, same exact thing for exercise. But what I'm getting to is this, is that in the long run, there's human physiology. And so that we know how it works, meaning like, you know, we shouldn't go overboard with any one macro and we shouldn't go overboard really with any type of exercise. And within those parameters and within those guidelines, we know certain things. So for example, when we're talking about how often we should be exercising, well, muscles need about 48 to 72 hours to recover. All right. So this is really important. I'm going to kind of give you some of the science along the way and then weave in what um, I've seen in my practice. So again, I've been in the fitness world since the late 90s. And that means I've been personal training at that time. And I've really had the privilege of working with thousands and thousands of clients. You know, I've, I've said it before, but we've worked with, we've done over a quarter of a million client appointments, and that's some serious data. So what I'm giving you today is the data from that, but also just other scientists out there, other PhDs and people with great knowledge inside of the space. So this first one's coming from the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And this was done on downhill running. Why I like looking at this study is that downhill running actually is an eccentric based movement. Eccentric is a strong eccentric movement. So think of it this way. I want to explain what eccentric means. It's like the negative to a movement. So it means like when you're doing a, a bench press, so most people know what like a dumbbell chest press is. You're lying on your back and you're just pressing up with two weights kind of working your chest. So that's an easy one to think about. Well, on the way down with that, as you're moving the dumbbells or barbell down towards your chest or doing a push-up, as you're lowering your chest down towards the floor, that's the lowering phase. It's also called the negative. It's also called the eccentric phase as you're lowering, right? So when we're looking at that, it actually puts the greatest amount of stress on the muscle at that time. There's the most muscle damage created during that eccentric phase. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because during that eccentric phase, you're creating the microscopic muscle damage or tears, just microscopic though, of course. It's what allows them to rebuild stronger. Okay, That's what creates that damage, but they rebuild stronger. How long does that take? Well, it takes about two days, about 48 hours, about 72 hours maximum is where we're looking at for those muscles to repair. Now, that's just normal, again, normal running. We're talking about on a weekly basis, not a massive workout, all right? So like not after a competition or something like that, which might take weeks. We'll talk about that in one moment. So the British Journal of Sports Medicine said that muscle soreness or that muscle recovery is about 48 hours, all right? The movement matters. So they were saying downhill running causes the most damage to the muscles. And that's because when I look at it, well, of course, running downhill, you're, you're actually absorbing the most force. So there's going to be the most eccentric strike, the, the most damage to the muscles. But it said that the same is not true necessarily on a flat surface, all right? And you can actually go back to that a little bit faster. Interesting to see. That was, again, the British Journal of Sports Medicine, if you want to look it up. And Dr. John Berardi, really a fan of his work. I kind of was a, a young guy in the industry and would look to Dr. John Berardi initially for nutrition and uh, exercise. Really smart guy. He used to be a, a bodybuilder. What he would say is based on looking at a lot of the research himself is that a full recovery. So a full recovery takes about 7 to 14 days if you take everything into the equation. Now, that does not mean that you shouldn't actually work out for 7 to 14 days. He does agree that after 48 hours of rest, you can get back to your workouts. Now, 48 hours is not the answer yet. I'm going to give you that towards the end. All right. So we have some agreement there. And I do agree. Like After a hard workout, it might take a week or so to fully repair, get all the muscle... Well, muscle glycogen can be uptaken pretty quick. But full repair, especially after competition, might take a little longer. All right. Matt Fitzgerald. So I'm not as familiar with Matt Fitzgerald's work, but as I was just kind of looking something up, I, I thought this is interesting. Matt Fitzgerald does just a really nice breakdown of it takes essentially four factors to get those muscles to recover faster. All right. And it's your hydration level, your electrolyte status, muscle glycogen, okay, which means the sugar is being taken back up to the muscle, and the rebuilding of muscle protein taken in protein. So basically pretty simple is just making sure that you have plenty of fluids during your workout, and of course after your workout that you're taking in some carbohydrates after your workout. And if you're looking to repair faster, you'll actually do a pre, peri, and post-workout shake 
I've spoken about that before. If you want to check that out on the podcast, every TT, every training Thursday, I give you a new exercise related or sometimes toxicity. I throw some of those in there related topic. So go back and check out previous training Thursdays at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. You can just literally type in TT in the search bar and all the training Thursdays will pop up. So basically, Matt's saying essentially what I would say, if we're not talking about body transformation, we're just talking about muscle repair, you'd want to take in some carbohydrates, some electrolytes, carbohydrates during the workout. And after the workout, then maybe an hour or so later, you'll take in a meal that consists of a decent amount of protein. Okay. So that's, again, that's very simplistic. I've gotten in deep and in detail on who should take in carbs, who shouldn't, how long to wait after a workout, meaning body transformation. You're actually not going to take in carbs before the workout, during the workout, and you'll wait a little bit of time after the workout so that you continue to break and burn up body fat. But again, I give that on a previous show. If you're just looking to repair from a workout, well, carbohydrates are without a doubt the easiest way to do that. People say like, oh no, you can get it from protein. Yes, But that protein you need to actually utilize as a carbohydrate. The actual conversion is not as easy. And you're going to do it anyway, so you might as well give your body some carbohydrates. Like Carbohydrates are not the enemy. It's fun to always have a villain, and we always make it out to be that way. But your body needs all the macros, fat, protein, and carbs. If you take any of them away, you're not going to be a balanced human being. And in the long run, you're not going to be as healthy. That's the bottom line. All right. Last one is from Pete Fitzjenner. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but I did my best. Again, I'm not as familiar with Pete's work, but I I did like to give a little tip here. And again, I know that this is kind of maybe self-explanatory, but sometimes it's not, right? Is that if you don't get as much sleep, you're not going to recover as fast and it's actually going to take you longer. So you know, here's the deal. Sleep is important to recovery. It's why elite athletes, any athlete that I work with, they are in bed for at least eight and a half to nine and a half hours, all right? That's the minimum. And the reason is, that their job is exercising. That's and So part of their job is then to sleep because they need to recover. I want them in bed at least nine hours. That's what I tell them, okay? And I want them in bed for peak repair hours, which means before 10 p.m. A lot of the athletes that I work with, very difficult, right? That's hard to get them to do that, but I just try to get them to do that to the best of their ability. If they're going to be going to bed later and they're going to be sleeping later in the day, well, we use a little bit of melatonin and things like that, which I can talk about on another show, kind of sleep hacking, as they say. So one of the reasons why I use melatonin is, is what Pete goes into is that a lot of people that are overtrained are actually waking up in the morning. They're waking, well, I should say they're waking up around 3 a.m. or so, 2, 3, 4 a.m. And that's because they are overtrained and they're not able to stay asleep and their sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive. It's funny. Not a lot of people know about this. So I was impressed that Pete Fitzjenner, uh, exercise physiologist, knew about this. And so, again, impressed. I like that. I love when people are talking about the nervous system. Because people come to my practice and they, you know, they tell me, I always ask them like, hey, how do you sleep? We talk about that for about five minutes and we go in depth and I ask them every different angle about sleep. And a lot of people do wake up and I, and I just show them like if you're waking up with an accelerated heart rate, if you're waking up with a little bit of night sweats or if you're waking up to have to urinate and, you know, like all of these different things. And I explain them that can be actually a weakening of your body's ability to keep well, certain types of hormones suppressed and also active during the night. It could be a thyroid-based issue. It can be higher levels of cortisol. It could be higher levels or lower levels of blood sugar, which are then spiking the body to produce more cortisol. Uh, it could be lower levels of melatonin. Like We can go through the whole process. And again, there's a great lab called the sleep and stress test. We offer the sleep and stress test. I hardly ever talk about it. Again, these are not our labs. We make them available to people all over the world so that they can really get in deep and figure out what's going on with their health. But that's a great one as well. All right. So that's essentially a lot of the science. I love looking at that specific part of it. One more I wanted to give you before I give you the different splits of training routines that I would recommend is this was written up in the Journal of Sports Medicine. This is about about two years ago. And peer-reviewed study, it's, it's actually scientists analyzed 10 previous studies based on muscle growth and recovery. And the article was actually written up by Brad Schoenfield, and I've heard of Brad's work many times. So I know it's a reputable source. I know he's an intelligent guy. And what they looked at was, okay, we're going to look at how many times a week should you train with weights for a specific muscle group in order to get the best results. So they looked at once a week, twice a week, or three times a week. And what they found is that when they worked a muscle twice a week, it grows twice a week, it grows more than when you just train it once a week. And now you might be saying to yourself, well, of course, you know, like, you work the muscle twice a week. Why wouldn't it? 
But then they did a different study and they looked at, okay, let's say those people who did bicep curls for the same volume, which means let's say you did three sets on Monday and then on Thursday you did another three sets of bicep curls. Okay, that's two different workouts, but it's six total sets. So they looked at people who did six sets on just one day. And what they found was that actually, they don't know why yet, but if you did three sets on two different days versus six sets on just one day, you actually got better results by separating the workouts. Very interesting, right? Very interesting to me because if you're just looking at volume alone, like the amount of work that you need to do, you can see that's not the end-all be-all is that you actually, it looks like you need to keep those muscles active in order to keep those gains. I would agree with that, right? I'm going to give you my evidence, again, from a quarter of a million appointments to look at you know, functional medicine and fitness and all these things that go together. And so really, really great. They looked at people who then trained three times a week. The actual gains were not as large, meaning like um, it wasn't as exponential jump as when you saw twice a week. So twice a week really is the gold standard. And it's funny because uh, again, I've been in this industry quite a while. I love this industry and I love giving credit to all the brilliant people that we've had you know, come up in this industry. And one of those people is Dr. Wayne Westcott. And I'm sure that if you've been listening to Cabral Concept, You've heard me talk about Dr. Westcott before, a guy from Massachusetts, great, I believe he's a doctor of exercise physiology. I may be mistaken in that, but anyway, great researcher as well. And uh, he worked with the senior population and he wrote a bunch of books. I've read them all. I actually invited him to do a seminar when I was, I spoke about this on Monday. So check out Monday's podcast if you haven't heard that. That was episode 906. And that was about myself going around and I used to consult for all these high-end health clubs. And so for one of them, they had a great team. And I said, I would love to be able to bring in someone and speak to all of our team. So I brought in Dr. Westcott. This was a million years ago. Literally, it was like, yeah, it was 2005. And I had him come in and he gave a great talk. He literally went through this whole PowerPoint presentation, gave a great talk. And he showed that for seniors and those looking to really get back muscle tone, strength and bone, and not allow osteoporosis to further is twice a week. That's what he said. Two sets of each of the different exercises twice a week. So I go back to that and I'm like, okay, Journal of uh, Sports Medicine said the same thing. Brad's research over those 10 different studies as well. Same exact thing. You have to get in two weight workouts per week. If you're not doing two weight workouts per week, you are literally missing out on a myriad of benefits like anti-aging, muscle tone, metabolism, blood sugar regulation, preventing osteoporosis, neurological-based dysfunction. I mean, I can't recommend enough just two weight workouts per week, but we're going to get into that right now. All right. So without further ado, why don't we get into it? All right. So many of you know, many of you have already downloaded. It's it's completely free. You just go to stephencabral.com. There'll be some little drop-down menu or whatever it might be to get our welcome package. The welcome package is, I have to update it you know, soon as well, but it's really just kind of an intro like, hey, this is your ideal workout week. And here's a my favorite smoothie recipe. It's my purple crush smoothie that I do every morning. And, you know, so I just, and here's some functional medicine tests. So it's like all of those different things are, are there. It's, it's just a nice little welcome package that we offer to people. We've been doing that now for about seven years. And one of the things that I talk about is the ideal workout week. Well, I'm going to be getting more in depth in this because as you know, as I'm doing my Ayurvedic series, is that there's three main body types. Now we're going to be getting more into it on episode 914, which is coming next Tuesday. I might do it Tuesday or Wednesday. We'll see. It might be on Wednesday, 9.15, but you'll see. It'll be out next week. And it shows that there are three main body types. There's the ectomorph or the vata. There is the pitta or the mesomorph. And then there's the endomorph or the kapha. Now, each one of these body types is very unique. So the, the just think of it as frame size. It's not really just about muscle. So a lot of people think the pitta body type has more muscle. It's true that they're able to get more muscle tone, but it's actually the kapha body type that adds the most mass. Like that's that's the truth of the equation. It's just they don't look as ripped, you know, and not as defined as the mesomorph. And the vata can also add muscle too, but it's all about the frame of the individual. So the vata frame is the thinnest. The mesomorph frame is more in the middle. They have broader shoulders though. They have a more athletic body type look. And then the mesomorph is the thickest frame, meaning thickest bone structure, okay? So when you look at that, you can say, okay, when we say, what can the body hold up to? Well, we say, okay, the vata has the fastest metabolism, the ectomorph, right? The thinner joints has the fastest metabolism and the highest proclivity towards the sympathetic nervous system. Whereas the kapha body type 
has less of the metabolism, meaning ramped up, get up and go, fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system, more of the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? They also have the largest bone structure. Their body is the best equipped to deal with a lot of exercise and work, right? And that's great because that's what their body type needs. And the ectomor or vata actually needs less of that. They're going to be hard gainers in terms of muscle. So what they need to do is actually less workouts per week, believe it or not. And the kapha body type needs to do more workouts per week, but not necessarily heavy, heavy weight training. And then you have the pitta or the mesomorph in the middle, which is basically a mix of that, depending on their specific goals. It's easy for them to add muscle, for sure, but not as easy to add overall mass and thickness as that kapha body type. So let's go over that right now. And so you're going to see how it varies a little bit based on body type, but I'm not going to be going too much into body type workouts today. And the reason is that in the subsequent weeks, in the future weeks, I'll actually be doing a breakdown of my de-stress protocol. And one of those weeks, of course, is on exercise. And I'll be doing it from an Ayurvedic perspective. So I'll give you an Ayurvedic workout for the Vata, Ayurvedic workout for Pitta, Ayurvedic workout for the Kapha, as well as the seven sub-doshas or subtypes. So We'll go into all that. We'll make it really straightforward and so you can find the right one for you. All right. So ideal workout week. I've given this before. I'm going to give you a variation of it today because it's very simple, very straightforward. All right. And then I'm going to give you what I see work every day in my practice. So if we're looking at how many times a week you should work out, the answer is this, is that we need to be doing two to three resistance workouts per week. Okay. And how much cardio do we need to do? About two to three cardio workouts per week. That does not mean you need to do six days per week. So we're going to get all of that in right now. All right. So when I'm looking at it specifically, I'm saying I have a Monday through Sunday, right? I have seven days of the week. I need at least two of them to be weight training, right? And then I can base it a little bit more on body types or whatever we're looking to do. Now, based on the research as well, I want those workouts for the same body part, which we're going to be talking about right now, at least 48 hours apart, right? So if we're doing two resistance workouts... I can't have them on a Monday, Tuesday, and Monday, Wednesday is okay, but there could be even a better scenario. I'm going to give you that right now. All right. So on Monday, ideal world. Again, you can vary the days of the week that you want to put them on, but a Monday, great day for resistance workout, okay? I like resistance workouts. They're going to be the best thing for the metabolism, and you could do them in a number of different ways, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So resistance just means working your body with some type of weight. Could be body weight, could be TRX, could be kettlebells, could be dumbbells, could be bands, whatever you're into. Absolutely fantastic. But you have to add some type of resistance to the body. I do believe that most people need a little bit more resistance eventually, not right away, but eventually beyond their own body weight. And the reason is this, is that if we're looking at bone mass, there needs to be some type of pressure, especially on the femur, which is that leg, upper bone in the leg and hips to prevent a lot of fractures later in life. So now, could it just be uphill sprints or walking? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that, that could be fine. But I'd like to do a little bit of weight training for the lower body at least, okay, beyond body weight. Now, you could just do push-ups and pull-ups and things like that for the upper body, totally fine. But I like to get a little bit of squats, a little bit of deadlifts, a little bit of step-ups, maybe even some lunges in there as well for those legs with a little bit of weight. And again, that's going to boost your metabolism to a higher degree. So we have a resistance training workout on Monday. On Tuesday, we can do cardio. On Wednesday, cardio could be intervals, so it could be sprints, or it could be a little bit of endurance-based, again, based on your goals as well. Wednesday can just be a rest day. It could be active rest. It could be hatha yoga. It could be some stretching. It could be some light core work and foam rolling and massage and sauna. Any one of those things would be great. On Thursday, now we're into resistance training workout number two, right? So we have Tuesday off and Wednesday off from resistance training, even though Tuesday we're doing cardio. So if we look at that, wow, okay, now great. We have a second resistance training workout 72 hours later, right? So that's a great way to look at it as well. We get the maximum recovery in those muscles specifically. Okay. Then on Friday, we have cardio workout number two. Maybe you vary it. Maybe you did uh, more of a, let's say you went for a two or three mile bike, well, probably go longer if it was on a bike, but let's say it was a jog. And then on Friday, maybe you're doing sprints, okay? Or it might be the same thing, again, based on goals. What if your goal is to run a 5K or 10K? Well, then you're going to maybe be doing a little bit more of the, well, you could do some fartlek-based training, 
but also um, you're probably going to have one day in there certainly of resistance training. I mean, I'm sorry, of longer resistance training. Okay. Now, Saturday, I like people. So if we're doing just ideal workout week, I like people to pick a workout that's going to bring up one of their weaker spots. Now, if they're perfectly happy with the way they are, then just go have some fun. Go do some like rock climbing or indoor rock climbing or go out there and be active, you know, just go play some basketball, whatever it might be. Or you could do a more formal workout to pick up where you might be lacking. Let's say you are someone who wants to put on a little bit more mass, a little bit more weight or muscle, however you want to look at it. Then you might do another resistance-based training for some of the body parts that you want to put on a little bit of that mass. And again, you'd still have 48 hours of recovery in there, both from Thursday, but also until the next Monday workout. So that's a great day to do that. If you're someone like, let's just say you're more of a kapha body type, you're an endomorphic body type, and you have trouble keeping the weight off, well, this would be a good day for another cardio-based workout. Because remember, again, a lot of people aren't going to get this at first, but remember, as we go through the Ayurveda, I will teach all of these things, is that your proclivity, and that's the best way to describe this, is towards adding more mass on your body. You don't need a lot of the extra weight training because your body already has a lot of mass. What you want is actually to continue to actually move a little bit more towards catabolism. And again, I know that doesn't make sense right now specifically thinking about it, but your body's always in more of an anabolic state. It's in adding more of an additional base state. Now, of course, you're still doing your two weight training workouts per week. You're going to keep your muscle, but you actually might need a little bit more towards cardio, believe it or not, to keep that body moving, to keep that furnace going. And that's why a cough of body type or endomorphic body type, they can actually exercise almost every day of the week cardio from a cardio basis and probably should to keep that metabolism going. Because it's like, I always give the analogy of this, the ectomorph or vata body type, the hamster's always on the wheel. It never gets off. Even when it's sleeping, it's basically just moving at a slower pace. But that endomorph, the hamster likes to get off the wheel and take naps throughout the day, likes to get his rest, you know, his three meals per day, all of those different things. And of course, I'm just joking. But keep in mind, that's why we need to get that hamster back on the wheel more often to stoke that metabolism. And and it's a real thing. Trust me, this is a real, real thing. And we can look at it from an exercise physiology perspective in terms of the autonomic nervous system, which means sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic nervous system. And how when you're more in that fight or flight for that ectomorph or vata body type, you're just burning, your body's burning fuel at a much faster rate. And it's also burning glucose, which is why that vata body type can eat more carbohydrates versus the endomorph that can't because they're not in a glucose burning state. They're in more of a fat burning state which again, like I'm going way off topic here. And I know that doesn't make sense initially because you're like, well, if they're in more of a fat burning state, but they're more prone to adding body fat, how does that make sense? Well, I'll explain that in the future, but basically that endomorph body type takes those carbs, stores them as fat because they're in more of that parasympathetic nervous system and they can actually tap into fat rather than tapping into glucose at a different degree. I'll go into more of that and go into the science behind it as well, because we have great science of now why they knew that 6,000 years ago. So Really, really simple. I wrap up this podcast by sharing with you exactly what we do in my practice in Boston every single day of every single week. And we've been doing this now for many, many years. Like I said, probably you know anywhere between 10,000 and 20,000 appointments a year. And we have a lot of data. And so this is what we do. We use the research, but I also it's what we've seen work. And this is the truth. This is what works. We like people to do three days a week. We've seen tremendous results in three days a week. If you can only give yourself three days a week, if you can work with a personal trainer, if you work with a partner, if you can pop in some, do a video online, what like whatever, right? Three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, probably even more ideal because a lot of people's cheat meal or flex meals on a Friday or Saturday night. So you want to get something if you can on that Friday or Saturday, right? So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, great days to do it. I could get more into this in terms of body part splits, meaning that You can actually work a Monday, Tuesday with weight training if your same body part isn't being worked that next day. So a lot of people do upper body on Monday, lower body on Tuesday. That's not what we do in my practice at all. We do full body workouts. Again, I'll go into this in the future because this will take another half hour. (laughs) For for real, it will. So why don't I do that the next coming weeks, like the workouts that you can do? I I will do that. I'm going to put that in so that I don't don't take more of your time today because I do like to be respectful and I do like to keep the podcast to about 30 minutes so that you can accumulate the knowledge. Then my goal is to get you to listen to the podcast daily so that you can just keep accumulating the knowledge. So I'm already putting in my notes right now. Next week, body part splits. It's in the notes. It will be there. Body part splits next week. So we'll, we'll go into that. We'll talk more about how you can actually split the body parts if you want to work out, if you want to weight train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, what those body part splits would look like. 
and um, how you can actually add cardio in to, well, let's talk about that just quick to end the show. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days a week. Well, how do you get in your two to three days of weight training and your two days to three days of cardio when you're only doing three days a week? Well, that's the minimum that I like to see. And with this, what we do, we combine a workout that it's the high intensity interval based training. Ours is a little bit different because our sets last some around two to three minutes. I saw this work over and over and over, but the science hadn't proved it out. The science proved it out a, a couple of years ago, about four years ago now. But we'd been doing two to three minute sets, and a lot of people were like, well, that doesn't make any sense because, like, you know, the best intervals only last 20 seconds to maybe 60 seconds, 90 seconds maximum. While we were doing two to three minutes and getting great results, science proved it out, showed that it does work. It works phenomenally well. You build up a lot of lactic acid in the body, and you're able to tap into a lot of body fat. So we do two to three exercises in a row, a maximum of five. And then we rest uh, about the approximate same time that it took to do that set. And then we get back into it. Works phenomenally well. It combines cardio and weight training into one workout. And I'll talk about that more in the future as well. So hopefully today's show was helpful. Hopefully you enjoyed today's show. If it was, let me know on Instagram or at cabralsupportgroup.com. That's our free Facebook group. You're welcome to join. We'd love to have you. And as always, if this show is helpful, please do feel free to pass along to anyone else you believe it could serve. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable, and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.